Don't know about you, but I have found that the last series, or the series that we are now still busy with, is quite challenging. I don't think I've been in a, in a sermon or prepared one that hasn't challenged me personally, and I have heard from many of you how it has challenged you too. But we thank God for His guidelines within Scripture that can guide and lead us on how to live and how importantly it is to live holy. So as we come to this morning, uh, the topic I'm using is nothing good about adultery. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, after we have just declared through songs, Jesus, that we would like to speak Jesus into the areas of our lives. Dear Lord, in our heart desires only you. But often, dear Lord, we know that our words are sometimes empty, and that our actions do not always bring you glory. So this morning, as we humbly come before you, we humbly set ourselves before you, dear Lord, and drawing our sight towards you, Father, we pray that you will minister to each and every one through the work of your Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, as we come and sit at your feet to be taught, dear Lord, we know that you know our minds, our thoughts, our hearts our deeds, dear Lord, even those that are done in secret. Dear Lord, so that we can come before you vulnerable and say, Lord, transform, renovate. Dear Lord, the hearts, especially those that are deep within us, Father, the doors that we cho choose to close, may we open them to you and ask that you would cleanse us from deep within. As we come before you today, dear Lord, we know that there are times that we dishonor you the way we live, the way we speak or treat others. So this morning, we humbly ask your forgiveness. And Father, as, I, as your servant come before you this morning, I ask that your, your, the words that I speak will not be mine, but be blessed to each and every heart through the work of the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, that as your word that comes and speaks to us will challenge us, will uplift us, dear Lord, will transform us through the work of of your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. I stand here today and I must admit that I do not take this statement of nothing good about adultery lightly at all. I have seen the destruction that this sin or the non adherence to this command, how it has destroyed lives and families, and particularly with no difference of stories. They're always destructive. In fact, this is one of the commands that I feel is one for the pages of history, history that is gone as well as history that is to come. So it is written in Exodus 20, verses 14, short, sweet, concise, and to the point, you shall not commit adultery. This seems to be clear, cut to the point. However, let us first find a definition before we continue that the dictionary gives to us of this word adultery. It means voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and a partner other than the lawful husband or wife. However, Jesus comes and teaches us in Matthew 5 and takes this command and expands it a little bit more for us. He says to us in Matthew 5, verses 27, You have heard that it is said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, Jesus says, that you, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman or a man lustfully has already committed adultery in their hearts. So it's a heart thing. This command establishes the value, first of all, for marital faithfulness. And when marriage vows are actually made, it is made in public and before God. It's not taken lightly. So from the beginning, we establish that this is a biblically based vow that we are making, and it cannot be mended or manipulated. And I often find that in our lives today and in the world today, we take scripture and we manipulate it to how we want to understand it, how we feel comfortable with it. Stepping outside of this command, 
definitely brings destruction on a different and another scale. It is one of those that there, there isn't a soft point to it. There is not and will never be anything good about adultery. And we find that in Scripture it tells us often about the stories of adultery and the events that followed thereafter. But I want us to stand with first an explanation from Genesis 1, which teaches us where it all started, the plan that God specifically had for us. Genesis 1 verses 26 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move around the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created their male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Verse 31 then says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. You hear intent, purpose. Genesis 2 then says to us, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. And for she was taken out of a man. That it is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. A gift that God has given to his creation. I want us to turn and you are welcome to read along with, with the Bibles that are in the pews. We began to read about a significant story in scripture written in 2 Samuel 11 verses 1 to 16. And then we're going to read in Luke 19 later on about the walk of Jesus or the ride of Jesus through Jerusalem. But we start off first with the beloved story of David and Bathsheba. Samuel is um, one of those scriptures that reveal to us the kings and the prophets of the scriptures, and one of them is about the famous David. So I read to you from verses 11, uh, 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 chapter 11, verses 1, it says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, note that, kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She, she came to him and she slept with him. Then he went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So we asked Uriah, haven't you just come from the military camp? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and to drink and make love to my wife? As surely as I live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, 
Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Urias remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David's invitation, um, at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among the master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army, army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. We're now going to go to another familiar passage where Jesus, like um, Isaiah, say, uh, Isaiah said in, in chapter 53, verses 1, he was led like a lamb to slaughter, and this due to our adultery of our hearts when we are unfaithful to God. So we turn now to our gospel reading, Luke chapter 19. Again, a familiar scripture, but I want us to listen and allow God's Holy Spirit to speak to each and every one of us individually. It's a story where Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it. And bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, a whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they kept quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on, it, on another, because you did not recognize the time of God coming to you. We understand that adultery is a heart issue. We are most definitely gravely mistaken if we think that adultery is merely a physical act of unfaithfulness. Because we will understand that this is only but the tip of the iceberg and that it is a much bigger picture than we could ever understand. Jesus actually makes it clear that adultery is the fruit of which lust is the root. The seventh commandment has a much bigger lesson that's held for us here between that line that we think is so simple. Jesus makes it very clear that adultery can be committed in the heart without even touching someone physically at all or ever. When Jimmy Carter, a former president, said in an interview to the Playboy magazine, I have committed adultery in my heart many times, little did he realize that he was speaking a biblical truth. Without knowing it, he had spoken a truth to the people. Sadly, many did not even get that statement. They did not understand it. 
Some, of course, laughed it off and thought that he was joking. This is, however, a profound statement that he had made and a reality check for each and every one of us. That it is our hearts where everything starts. We might remain faithful outwardly, but inwardly, even secretly, we commit adultery, and the adultery of the heart, and often it is repeated oh so often, oh too often. So let us come and have a look exactly what does this mean to us. Firstly, how a godly person can fall. Scripture will teach us. How are these decisions that we are supposed to be making is to lead us to life? How does this topic even affect God? And what does this all mean to us? So firstly, how does a godly person fall? I'm going to ask the question first is, where do you find yourself? Let's go back to the, uh, the, the story of David. So remembering the story of David, we see that he finds himself on the roof of his palace. Nothing un, un, strange about that at all. Their, their roofs were flat, and they were able to have access to it. But there he sees Bathsheba. She's bathing. There is probably nothing wrong with being on the roof. And he probably couldn't have walked past without seeing it. But from his view, he could be lured by this picture that he saw. It stirred within in him an interest. The problem is he acted upon it. We cannot go through life thinking that we are blind or blind to things that are happening around us. So when the question is asked, where do you find yourself? The question is actually, where do you find yourself being distracted? It is not necessarily the place that you are in, but the distractions that are luring you into acting, acting out the sin that will become destructive to you as well as to those around you. In David's case, it was a battle of lust that first and foremost found a settling place in his mind, in his heart. The act or the thought of lust. Lustful thoughts are even able to creep into us as we are listening to a sermon. As you're driving to work or to fetch your children at school, lust can sneak in. Even while you are praying, lustful thoughts can enter into one's mind. David's nightly walk was not a sinful act. No, the fact that the scripture tells us that David had sent his whole army out to battle, but stayed behind, was the first red flag for him. He was not meant to be there. He was meant to be out with these people. He was not supposed to be there. The great and famous king, the writer of that psalm that we so often um, quote from Psalm 23, was the man on the roof, the king appointed by God himself. Scripture even says that he was a man, um, a man after God's own heart. And here he too fell victim of the oldest sin of all, the sin of lust. The question to us again is, what are you looking for? What are we looking for when we are out there? This case study of David is, this, this specific case shows to us that he had, he had fought against, he had fought for this position that he had held. He finds himself on the roof feeling very proud. He was respected. He was even feared by his enemies. And here he was standing looking out on his city probably feeling that he was well accomplished. He had no one to be accountable for. He was alone. No one to keep an eye on him. Now, I know we cannot go through life with blindfolds on. We walk through this life that we are in. We cannot pretend that nothing around us is happening, that there aren't all the time temptations around us. The difference is that we should not be distracted by the sins that are luring us into spaces that we are not supposed to be acting upon. In David's case, he didn't get on the roof to go and find Bathsheba. He didn't go and look for a woman that was bathing. No, he happened to see her. We have dealt with many of the commands so far already. And we have seen that it is not the object that we see 
or the wrong opportunity that comes. No, it is the way that we react or act upon these things that are placed in our lives that is the sin, that causes the destruction, the stealing, the lying, the cheating, the anger, the acting on the heart's desires. That is what leads us astray and away from God. So what is one's eyes drawn to? What are we looking at? What are we fixing our eyes on? Is that what we need to caution against? That what we are looking at that is around us, that we are swayed by, that we are persuaded by? The things that are coming into place in our world today is things that are coming to lure us, to change our minds, to look at things differently, the way God had created us. The question is, what are you seeking for? Romans 12, Paul comes and he gives us a good bit of advice. It says, we are to be a living sacrifice. Romans 12 says to us, therefore I urge you, Paul says, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The way we conduct ourselves is meant to show our true and proper worship. He goes on to say, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can be swayed by this world and all the new things that are stepping in, but God asks us to renew our minds in him. Paul continues to say, then you will be able to test and approve that God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Good advice from Paul. Sin finds a place in our hearts when we are not willing to submit to everything God has given to us. But we will not know it if we do not know Scripture. When Paul speaks about the body, it includes not only the physical, but also the mind and the soul. And we see that in the case of David when his heart and mind was not in the will of God. It all needs to be offered to God as a holy and pleasing sacrifice, as our true and proper worship. We cannot offer only certain portions of our lives. We cannot only offer certain areas of our lives to God. No, it is all or it is nothing. David's case, he had become proud and self-sufficient. He stood out there feeling very accomplished. He felt entitled to what he was looking for, to such an extent that when he called for Bathsheba, she was not allowed to say no, because he was the king. In searching for meaning of life, the seeking for what makes one happy or satisfied, we often look for the self-satisfaction that life brings to us. And that's exactly the platform that the devil is needing to plant that unexpected seed of lust in our lives, in our minds, and in our hearts. Lust justifies our actions, may I tell you. It finds excuses for things that we do. But I was unhappy. I needed happiness in my life. I felt not heard. I felt unnoticed. I was hurting and needed healing. And I looked it in the arms of someone else. So what are your desires? Are they in tune with what God is requiring of your life? Our biggest mistake is acting on our desires and not God's. Desires of self-satisfaction which spring from power and of greed. Psalm 119 verses 9 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? Listen well, young people. By living according to your word, God, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. There's a Christian poet that writes exactly about a beautiful um, psalm, Psalm um, 31, I think it is. And she speaks about keeping her heart pure, engraving God's word upon her heart so that she will find the man in her life that God has sent her. May that, that will be my prayer for each and every young person that is still sitting here single, that God will send you, like Mike came and testified today, the right person in your life. 
If only we heed to God's word, seek out his desires, then the doors of temptation will no longer be found in your attention so easily. But it's because we are looking for our own desires that we often find the doors of temptation wide open for you to walk into and to in, 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 in entertain. The other danger is acting on self-satisfying desires. David investigated. He asked around and found that she was married. This did not deter him, however, to go ahead with what he had planned. He was in the direction of self-satisfying, satisfying his desires that he had found, and he was determined to fulfill it in any way possible. This was not an unknown command to him. I think this command was better known to him than it was to us today. They were taught it since they were small. It was announced in, in the synagogues each and every day. The temple words were often the Ten Commandments. It wasn't unknown to him. It was part of his teaching on a regular basis for them. He knew it was wrong. He knew it within his heart, but yet he acted upon it. It was not an instant reaction, if you read Scripture once again. No, he actually worked out a plan of how to get the Sheba. He used his power and authority to make it happen. She even gave herself to him. When, he didn't, when his plan didn't come out the way he wanted it, he panicked. But he continued planning. He made sure that he would be able to cover his tracks in all ways that he possibly can. He went to the extent that he had someone murdered and claimed that which was lawfully not his. He claimed Bathsheba for himself. What he didn't bargain on was that God knew it all. God had seen it all. And so many lives were destroyed, including his own child, because of this act. He thought, like many, in the theater of the mind, many things that take place that would never be mentioned in public would be safe. Often our sinful ways are done in our minds, in the theater of our minds. Things that you will not even mention in public. Ray Pritchard most definitely knew that when he made the statement. The sin that is most likely to be acted upon is lust, which is within the mind. Starts developing within the heart, the root of all evil. He would have liked it to remain secret, David, but it never happened that way. Committing adultery can and will never be able to remain a secret. And those of you who have been through the pain of that will understand it. It finds a way of destruction, of lying, of covering up and continued planning of self-satisfaction. It's a continuation. It's a spiral into the darkness. Adultery shatters loves and leaves it in ruins. It causes mistrust. Protection measures are put into those who have felt the brunt of it. They put into place the feelings of hatred. And they make sure that they will, in the power that they have, never allow it to happen to them again. It causes spite. It causes hatred. So what are the decisions that lead to life when we speak about this commitment that we are meant to be making? First of all, we need to understand the things that we need to avoid. Firstly, we need to understand some of the things that are important to avoid that so easily is there for us available. I think the biggest evil, as well as a blessing, is the resource called Google. Easily on there, even our children can find pornography. Explicit magazines and pictures that are there. There are movies that I even have seen that has been graded 13 that I would not have shown my children when they were even 18. But today it is allowed. Swinging parties are the end thing. It entices people, it lures people, and once it has got you, it grabs upon your heart. And you will look for the excuses to be able to mangle and manipulate God's word to be able to say, it's okay for what I am doing. It is not. 
Do not be mistaken or misled. These are dangerous and can cause addictions far beyond your power to let go. It is not in your power to put away lust or the action upon lust. And may I give that warning to married and unmarried people. If you are in the grips of any of these, I pray that you find help. What are the things that I cannot and will not be tempted to? God warns in his people. And this is a harsh warning to each and every one of us because we often like to hear the, the messages that feel good. Because we can go to God and ask him forgiveness. But we need to understand that we have got an accountability to people around us as well, not to be manipulated and misled by the world and how they are changing scripture today. Malachi 2 verses 13 says, Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altars with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accept them with pleasure from your hands. You ask why? It is because the Lord is a witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner. The wife of your marriage covenant has not the one God made you you belong to him in body and in spirit. We often like to put God in specific areas of our lives, but yet he is part of everything in your life. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your God and do not be unfaithful to your wife or husband of your youth. We cannot think that if we just try it once and get away with it, it's going to be okay. I can promise you it is soul-destroying if one gets involved in any sort of thing that is related to lust. The scripture is clear when it comes to keeping the God's, uh, God's commandments. The one thing that we need to understand is marriage is a commitment, a covenant made not only with one another, but with God. We are warned in scriptures like Deuteronomy 23 verses 21 where it says, If you make a vow to the Lord, your God, do not be slow to pay it. For the Lord your God will certainly demand it from you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. Whatever your lips utter, you must, not, you must be sure to do, because you make your vow freely to the Lord your God with your own mouth. And these vows are made at the altar of marriage, and I remind you before, we, rem, we are reminded of that before God as well and those witnesses that we often like to call upon. So what are we to do? We are to choose purity. Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians 17, it's all about concerning a married life. It says, now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relationships with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring... Each man should have sexual relationships with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duties to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body who heals it to her husband. And in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his body but heals it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent, for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to others? No, to prayers. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because your lack of self-control. Jesus says in Matthew 19 that the only reason why divorce is permitted, and that is when there's sexual immorality committed, that is how serious this sin is. We are called to choose accountability. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That is what David was not doing when he was on that roof. He did not allow God to take his thoughts captive. And he acted upon his thoughts. So you might ask me, so how does this affect God? 
Firstly, my relationship with God is affected by our sinful living. Today we remember that famous entry into Jerusalem. It was not done without intent. Jesus had an intent to go there. It was not done without reason. Jesus had his reasons. It was not done without purpose. He was fulfilling God, his Father's purpose that day. But it is through our adultery in our relationship with God that brought him to come to this act. Jesus had to take the brunt of our adulterous hearts where we choose to serve other gods in committing sin, but he had to go and face our punishment. We did and do not stay faithful to him at all. And hence, I use the, the phrase that it is adultery starts within the heart. Jesus had to follow that path where people, of course, were displaying their commitment to him. They were cheering him on as the king. As he went through the streets of Jerusalem, they laid their clothes before him on the road, praising his name, worshiping him, committing their lives to him. And the next minute, they were hurling insults at him. They were demanding his death. They did not recognize him as king any longer because he was not doing as they wanted. There is no better display of adultery of the heart than this act. You might be sitting here and saying, but I haven't committed adultery to my partner, my husband or my wife. But we so easily commit adultery in our hearts towards God. So what is my commitment to the relationships? We cannot proclaim to love God and, and dedicate our lives to him, but our deeds do not display our commitment to this relationship. This relationship that we so often proclaim to friends and families and neighbors. When we commit to our relationship, we commit only when it is going our way. When we stood at the altar of marriage, we said through, sick, through sick, sickness and in health, through challenges and joys and all those nice things. And when we stood before God and accepted his invitation to receive him as Lord and Savior, it was not in exchange for wealth and prosperity and, and all those good things. No, we commit to a relationship because of the vows we are to keep, the vows that we make. Jesus watched as these people threw down their clothes, palm branches, they sang to him, but their hearts were divided, and hence Jesus wept. He cried for the city and the people. Their hearts were filled with so much sin. What are coven covenantal relationships? Well, we have two. One of them is a relationship that we have with God. God does not deviate from this. God keeps to his covenant to us. Jesus knew as he rode through the city that what was to come. He, he knew what the end product was. But yet he loved us so much that he refused to turn around. He was not going to lose his opportunity to offer us his unconditional love. And of course the wonderful gift of the promise of everlasting life. Marriage is seen, seen in the same way. We know that of all the possibilities of love, there's hatred. Committed, commitment to one another, there is a chance of cheating. And yet we choose to go ahead with it. We choose to stand before the altar and we say, I do. We are the only ones who can choose to remain in a covenantal relationship with God and with each other. It is a choice that we make. This goes even for those who are still single. Our committed relationship to God leads us to live by his commandments. And what does his commandments call us to do? It's to live a holy life. Abstaining from sexual immoralities. I don't think there's anything clearer in the Bible than this subject. The subject of sexual living for both those in covenantal relationships as well as for those in single relationships. If you want any sexual advice, go to Scripture. It will give it to you. Adultery of the heart leads us to sinning towards God and towards each other. We cannot profess one thing and live another way. God demands us in full, and so do our spouses now and for those who are to be. So what does this all mean to us? First of all, 
Proverbs 6 verses 32 warns us against the dangers that are unseen. And it gives us the warning. But the man who commits adultery, or the woman, is an utter fool, for he destroys himself and herself. Proverbs 5 verses 3 to 5 says, For the lips of an adulterous woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her st steps lead straight to the grave. It's not beating around the bush. It says to us exactly what are we supposed to be looking out for. We have got choices. And as David stood on that roof, he had a choice. As those people cheered Jesus on in those streets, they had a choice. As married couples, we have a choice. For those who are still single, you have a choice. Make sure that those choices are to live holy lives. Lives that honor God in the way he created us, created marriage, and committed himself to each and every one of us in love. If you listen how the rules and regulations are changing over the, over the world, it is astounding. And one wonders, what scripture are they reading? And we might ask the question, so is there hope? I want to say and I want to shout and say, yes, there is. It is in this season that we find ourselves that there is hope in Christ. He calls us to holy living to stand strong in the, in the di disciplines that he is teaching us and continues teaching us. It might seem as if we look, and, as we look around us and see what is happening around in the world that is hopeless. But as decisions are being made that astound us, that we think, how is it even possible? We might feel that how can we be the difference? You can. And as the motto is of Ransom, as we change one life, at a time, so God calls us to change our lives so that we can change others one life at a time. We are then reminded in, in, um, in Christ that we are to find our hope only. Only in Christ we can find. Romans 15 says to us, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. How? As you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. If David had only listened to the Holy Spirit within his mind and in his heart, he would not have acted upon that temptation that was luring him. So is there forgiveness? Categorically, yes, there is. We always need to understand that it first takes an act from ourselves to say, Father, we acknowledge our sin. We acknowledge that when we have stepped into the action of the temptation, that we have been lured from it, we need your grace. We are reminded that as we confess before God that he, our sins are as far as from the east is to the west. Psalm 103 says, So far as he has removed our transgressions from us, if only we acknowledge and we come before God and ask him for forgiveness. It is because of Easter that we are reminded of this forgiveness. Jesus died for that exact reason. His purpose that drove him through the streets of Jerusalem was the fact that he knew he needed, that we needed to be forgiven. The other fact was it's because we knew we could not save ourselves. Sexual immorality is one of those that we have not self-control over. We need God in order to help us with that. So perhaps if we're sitting here feeling pretty unclean, both our hearts when we have gone and, and served other gods in ways that we have let God down and not served Him as our only God. Perhaps you too have been in the grip of lust in any sort of way, physical or not. We stand before God in need of Him to clean us. I'm then reminded of that beautiful story that Jesus um, spoke about or that we were taught. And it is the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. In that 
courtyard, Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his fingers after the, the people had brought to it before Christ to be condemned. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older one first, until only Jesus was left with a woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared the beautiful words that Jesus leaves with each and every one of us. When we are found in sin, he says to us, go now and leave your life of sin. There is hope. There is freedom in asking Christ for forgiveness. There is freedom in leading a life that is scripturally holy. The story of David is one we can learn a lesson from. As we read Psalm 51, it is the story of, of David's confession, a prayer that he shouts out to God for forgiveness. His prayer is the answer to each and every one of us. When we come to Christ and we ask him, we need forgiveness, we acknowledge that we too have an adulterous heart in some way or another. We can come like David and ask, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Those who are unclean do not need to despair. All we need to do is to turn to Jesus and cry out for mercy, knowing for what he did for us on the cross, that we are called to holy living in all the, atmosphere, all the aspects of our lives. My plea as I close is do not delay, but do not despair. Jesus is, Jesus is waiting to wash each and every one of us clean of our sinful thoughts and our sinful hearts the adulterous way that we have treated others as well as God. The world out there is calling. The world out there is tempting. But as we focus our eyes upon Jesus, so he will lead us on his path. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, in you we come and we commit ourselves to you. We recognize the way that we have have given ourselves to other gods, those of lying, deceit, hatred, dear Lord, times where we have been lured by the world into areas of pornography, of lust, laughing at jokes, dear Lord, that are not of the heart of God. Dear Lord, so often our minds are distracted by the things of the world, and for that we acknowledge that we are sinful, that we are unclean but we come before you because you are our true hope. Father, as scripture has called us to holy living, may we seek your word that we're not coming to come and mend it or amend it, to change it or deform it. Father, but may we take your word as it is given to us and live holy lives as you have called your children. May we stand apart from the world Dear Lord, to show them what it is like to live the life that God has called us to do. Even in the gift that you have given to us as sexual beings, dear Lord, that you would call us to sexual holiness in all the ways that we live. Father, we give to you our unclean bodies, minds, and hearts, and we ask that you cleanse it and clean it so that it might be as white as snow again. As you send us out, Father, to go and live no longer in a sinful life, as you sent that woman, that desperate woman, dear Lord, that had been caught in the act of adultery. Dear Lord, so you send us out to go and sin no more. We pray that through your Holy Spirit that you will gift us that strength, that you will continue to guide and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen.